Okay, well, I really want to thank Margot for giving me the opportunity to be here. As I look out on this audience, it is incredibly exciting to see so many young women and a few male allies who are all interested in data science. And this afternoon on the panel, you know, I, I'll talk more about, um, more about career paths and stuff. Now I'm just going to talk about science, so I hope that's okay. Good. Um, okay, so the motivation for this is what I call the age of networks. You know, in the last 10, 15 years, as we've looked around, every place we look, we see networks. We see physical, technological networks like the Internet and the World Wide Web. We see social networks online and offline. We see biological networks. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to end, and I should mention that much of what is driving this is that these networks are producing data which really allow us to understand them much, much better than we could a few years ago. So uh, I'll talk about the observed networks, then I'm going to talk about five different classes of mathematical and algorithmic problems on these networks, much of it has to do with data science, and then I'm going to focus on one class of problems. So the observed networks, as I said, we have a whole host of observed networks, so let me tell you a little bit about them. First of all, I'm a mathematician by, well, I'm a physicist by training, but, um, you know, I'm a mathematician in my soul, and so I model these networks as graphs, so they have vertices and they have edges. And so one example of a technological network is the AS Internet. So AS is like Stanford.edu is an autonomous system. They could be walled off for cyber attacks to, to, uh, to prevent a cyber attack. And then we have edges which connect those networks. This is a large network, but then when we go to something like the World Wide Web, it's of a totally different scale. We have trillions of web pages, and this is a directed network. We have directed edges, hyperlinks, that, that connect them. There's another network which, in principle, is somewhat smaller, but very, very important, and, and I hope that many of you will be thinking about it. These are the cloud, the data center networks. This is where a lot of our computation will occur. Some people think that when they do a web search, it's free. Of course, it's not free. These data centers are sitting next to hydroelectric plants. They're using, we now use in this country about 5%, um, 5 percent of the energy use in this country is through data center networks, and it is increasing at a really rapid rate. So hopefully some of you will be among the people who figure out better algorithms, better ways of doing the data science on these networks so that we don't have to keep pumping oil out of the ground and doing worse things to get oil out of the ground. Um, okay, social networks. So for many, many years, we've studied offline social networks, and we still do. When we track the SARS virus, we're, you know, we're looking at an offline network. But there are, of course, online networks. I mean, the, the big ones in this area are Facebook and LinkedIn. There are many, many other online networks, and they have very, very different properties from each other based on whether they're uh, 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 directed networks or, or not, based on their scale, based on the kind of information that travels over them. Okay, there are economic networks. So when you go back to the AS Internet, it actually has peering agreements on it. There are three levels of the AS Internet. So you, you remember the AS Internet, Stanford.edu, AT&T.com, Microsoft.com, all of these are nodes on the AS Internet, AOL.com. So if you're in the highest level, you don't pay to have your information transported over any of the other levels. If you're on the second level, you have to pay to have your information transported over the first level but not over the second or the third. And on the third, you have to pay to have your information transported over the first or the second. And so economic, um, economic considerations 
tend to affect the routing on these networks. It makes certain kinds of traffic more susceptible to cyber attacks. So there's this interesting interaction of the technology and the incentives and the economic incentives on these networks. Okay, there are bipartite graphs of buyers and sellers. So, you know, for example, you can have uh, ad networks. Okay, so you have companies and you have, you know, uh, searches that are done and the, and, and, and the ads are sold. That's a bipartite graph of buyers and sellers. And there are more complex economic network. So in the second keynote, you will be hearing a little bit about online advertising, which actually is a data science, a network data science problem. Okay, there are also biological networks. So there are phylogenetic trees, which we've studied for years and years. You know, there are the species that are present today. And then from those, you try to infer where they came from, how they split off from each other. People like Tandy Warnow um, is a fantastic uh, data scientist who looks at these kinds of problems. Okay, there are gene regulatory networks, and I'm going to focus a lot of the talk on that. And then there are real neural networks, and it's actually very, very exciting because neuroscience is finally becoming a data science and one of the biggest Data, science, um, data sciences. And so now, you know, we're looking at slices of the mouse brain and trying to figure out what the connectome of a mammal actually is. Um, we, we've known about the connectome of a, you know, of a flatworm, which has 312 neurons for a long time. But this is a fantastic set of data that we're starting to look at. And for the first time, we may actually be able to make some progress on, psyche, on, on drugs for psychiatric diseases as we begin to understand these networks more. And also for things like Alzheimer's, which unfortunately many of us will, will get. OK, so what are the classes of mathematical and algorithmic problems on these networks? OK, so I'm going to talk about five classes. The first one is just modeling the network. So we start to model as maybe a physicist would do. And then we look at data and we ask, how does our model fit that data? And we keep refining the, the models. There's a question of how do we sample and how do we learn large networks? How do we do machine learning of large networks? And that's actually in the past three or four years been a lot of the focus of my own research, although I'm not going to talk about that very much today. Then there's processes on networks. So on top of a network which has some random structure, there are all kinds of random processes that occur. And again, we study these by looking at various kinds of data flowing on these networks. Then there are algorithms on networks. So how do you take a network and from the data that is flowing on it, conclude something interesting. And each time it seems that people have done this in a fundamentally new way, we see many new startups, new kinds of technology based on new algorithms on networks. And finally, there are network reconstruction algorithms. So there's a lot of sparse data out in the world. And from that data, from that sparse data, we try to infer what underlying network might have produced the data that we're observing. OK, so I'll talk about each of these. So if I'm going to model something, I have to tell you what I would like to model, what features I would like to include, OK? Because we, only, we don't want to include everything. We just want to include the relevant features. So what are some of these? Well, one of the interesting features of most of these networks is that they have small diameter. People actually think that Stanley Milgram first talked about six degrees of separation at Stanford professor. But actually, it was a Hungarian short story writer in 1929 who, I don't know how he hypothesized this, but in his short story, he hypothesized that everybody was connected to everybody else by six degrees of separation, everybody on Earth. And then Stanley Milgram did an experiment in which he gave postcards, let's say, to somebody in the Midwest and said, oh, this is an elementary school teacher in Massachusetts. You send this to the person you think would be on the shortest path from you to that elementary school teacher in Massachusetts. 
that is a local algorithm because you just look at your neighbors and then they look at their neighbors. He found six degrees of separation. And a few years ago at Facebook, John Kleinberg working with a team at Facebook, Lars Backstrom and some others, found that on Facebook there's about four and a half, um, four and a half degrees of, of separation. Not that different from six. Okay, another feature that we want our models to include is power law degree distributions. And people say that, you know, this is the signature of human activity. If I ask, what's the probability that I have K neighbors? A lot of things that we used to study 20, 30, 40 years ago fell off exponentially in parameters. But here, it falls off much more slowly, like a power law. The probability that I have K connections in a social network will fall off like 1 over K to a power. And interestingly, in biological networks and a lot of other networks, we see these, these power laws. And finally, aging of vertices. On both the AS Internet and the World Wide Web, older vertices tend to be more highly connected with lots of exceptions. Okay, so the model, which probably a lot of you know from about 15 years ago, Barabashi, um, Barabashi and Albert, and that's actually Reka Albert, a fantastic woman graduate student, um, said, okay, let me have a very simple model, kind of rich gets richer model, that each time a new node comes into the network, they connect to, let's say, two other nodes. How do they connect? They connect with probability proportional to the number of connections that node has already. That's why I say it's rich gets richer. And when you just look at this and do a back of the envelope calculation, you find that this falls off like a power law. And if you do the more rigorous analysis, you also find that it falls off like a power law. OK, so that's a very basic kind of thing. But what happens when the data doesn't support that? What happens when you see um, something in which, let's say, um, there are some sites that are not so old, okay, but they have lots more connections than some older sites. So there are variants of preferential attachment. And uh, Barabashi and uh, Bianconi, who was another woman graduate student of his, in, um, in 2001 came up with this wonderful um, model in which they said, okay, Every site is born with a certain fitness. And what happens is that um, if you're born with a higher fitness, then more people connect to you. So you're more attractive, you're more fit in some way. And the interesting thing for the physicists here is that what pops out of this, amazingly, when you do it rigorously mathematically, is what's called a Bose-Einstein condensation. So uh, there's an integral which diverges, which is the Bose-Einstein integral. So I'm, kind of geeky and I get very excited when I see these things. And, but what this means if you were to do a startup or something is that this pouring into the ground state is that a site is born such that a positive fraction of all future connections will be made to that site. So it has all kinds of economic, um, economic implications also. Okay. Competition model. So you could say it's just a random process. You could also say, oh, every site that comes in undergoes some kind of optimization. So they look around and they say, what is the other site that optimizes some quantity for me? And in fact, when you do peering agreements, you do this kind of thing. And so you can do that and you get certain other kinds of models. And then, and there's a, a faculty member at Stanford, Matt Jackson, who is the expert on this, he's in the economics department, if you have a fully game theoretic model, what, comes, what, what happens is that a site comes in, it does some optimization, it attaches to another site, and then all the other sites that come in attach and reattach, and you do this again and again and again until it reaches equilibrium, like a Nash equilibrium, and then you have a fully game theoretic model. This is the right model for a lot of strategic network interactions, but it's much harder mathematically, so a lot of data supports it. Actually getting models that act like this is, is harder. Okay, so now let's go on to, so we've modeled our network. Now let's go on to how we sample and learn from a large network. Okay, so um, as I said, the World Wide Web is very large. It's of the order of a trillion or several trillion static sites and growing. So if I wanted to calculate page rank, 
on the web. I, I wouldn't do this on trillions of sites. I'd want to sample and I'd want to ask, do I have a reasonable sample? And I was actually working on variants of PageRank about eight or nine years ago, trying to come up with um, a variant of page rank that would do um, that would get rid of web spam or kind of make web spam less less prevalent and I was working with a product group and I went to a wonderful graph theorist uh, uh, combinatorialist Latsi Lovas and I said coming from the physicist in me I said you must have a limit of graphs like statistical physics, you have a limit, which is thermodynamics. Or interacting particle systems, you have a limit, which is differential equations. And when you do calculations, you usually deal with the limit when you have something really massive. So there must be a limit for graphs because networks are getting really massive. And there was not, interestingly. So this started a whole line of research. It started in about 2004, we started publishing in it in 2006. We did this for dense graphs. We asked, how do you take a graph or a network and get almost like a fluid limit of it, okay? And why would you want to do that? Well, the reason you would want to do that is that if you don't get something like a fluid limit, you have so many parameters as your network grows that you're going to overfit your data. So you want something like a fluid network to get what's called a non-parametric fit. So for example, Facebook today is very, very big. If I wanted to model it, I wouldn't want to have, you know, uh, you know um, 20 million parameters, which I might have to if I were fitting with a parametric model. So I'd want to fit it to some kind of a continuous model and then show that if I sampled from this continuous model, I could tell you what Facebook is going to look, five, look like five years from now. So we first did the theory for dense graphs. Facebook is not dense. No massive graphs in the real world are dense. Dense means n sites of order n squared connections. Well, that can't possibly be. So really, we want sparse graphs with power law tails. So we were able to do this about a year ago. And finally, we were able to prove the theorems on machine learning of massive graphs with power law tails. And now a lot of people are using this theory, which is a continuum theory, to fit their data, and then from that, generate massive samples. So that's a big area of, of research. Okay, processes on networks. So the network itself could be formed by a random process or an optimization process, but then on top of the network, various things happen, like flow of information. So people like John Kleinberg have done beautiful work on this. They've got wonderful papers on how information flows on Facebook and other networks, okay? And if you have a different network like Twitter, a number of years ago with some grad students, we looked at how information flows on Twitter, very, very different from how it flows on Facebook. And we actually had a lot of trouble fitting that data even though we had the, the Twitter fire hose because it behaved so differently from what we had seen before. Okay, so spread of epidemics on networks. So Amin Saberi, who is a faculty member here when he was a graduate student, worked with me on this, and we looked at how, how epidemics flow, um, spread, and you, you could do this for something like a virus, but you could also, if, for a virus in a human population, but you could also look at how a virus or a worm spreads on a technological network or a network of computers, and you could also ask, what would you do to try to stop it or to try to limit it? Or you could do the inverse problem, which is a viral marketing problem, Okay, which is, I've got a big network like Facebook, I want to go and I want to, in some way, um, in some way, incent certain nodes of that network to like my product. Which nodes do I choose if I want it to spread as much as possible? So this is really the inverse of trying to stop a virus. This is trying to spread something. Okay, so there are wonderful models, wonderful problems. Lots and lots of data analysis is done on these models. Okay, there are algorithms on networks. So we all know about Larry and Sergey, you know, coming up with this PageRank algorithm, and it 
giving rise to this little company, which became a big company. It's based on a lot more than just the PageRank algorithm now. But there are still other kinds of PageRank algorithms. I mentioned that I had been doing spam, web spam suppressing page rank. Another kind of thing that we really care about now as networks become massive is that we want algorithms that don't give perfect answers, but that give answers very, very quickly. So sublinear algorithms. So you don't even get to read in the entire graph, and yet you have to come up with an answer, okay? And, you know, a, a, an approximately correct answer. So there's a lot of work on sublinear time algorithms. You come up with the algorithm, you test it, you see how it works, you do various hacks, you prove what you can, and test what you can. Okay, so you're, you're going to see that almost all of these lead to companies. Okay, there are clustering algorithms or collaborative filtering algorithms, if you like this, or sparse matrix completion, right? If, if you like this, then you'll like that. So Netflix has this graph of people and movies. You don't fill in that many entries, and yet it wants to fill in all the, all, and it, it does, at least for me, <laughs> it does quite well. I can't believe how well they complete that sparse matrix. I mean, I like really obscure movies, and it just it keeps getting them right for me. And the mathematics is, is beautiful. So both the data science and the mathematics is really beautiful here. OK, there's algorithms for multicasting. Um, and similar to these are algorithms for web hosting. So this, again, started with some little paper in Fox Stock Conference. We know that when too many people try to grab information from a site on the web, what happens is that that site can go down. So what I would like to do is I would like to mirror that information at various sites so that when people are trying to grab the information, it won't go down. But without knowing who's going to be trying to grab the information, where should I place these mirror sites? Okay, How do I anticipate, on average, how, where people are going to be grabbing from? So, Tom Layton and a student of his had some papers on this around the year 2000, and it turned into the company Akamai. Okay, there are this, these viral marketing things. I mean, there are probably some of you out here who are involved in viral marketing companies. Um, viral marketing sounds terrible, but I mean, it's actually really nice in some ways, in other ways not so. But anyway, um, so one of the things I've been working with some grad students on is, again, for massive networks, if you want to do this on Facebook, if you want to do it on LinkedIn, how do you do a sublinear algorithm for identifying influential sites? And then there are recommendation systems. Um, we're going to be hearing a talk from a woman who does recommendation systems. And I've worked on recommendation systems. You can take any trust network and you can ask, how do I propagate recommendations over that pr trust network? So on Facebook, you know, I've got lots of different networks superimposed. I mean, I've got my family, okay? I've got people from high school who have been pinging me, and I don't want to say no, so I say yes, and so they're part of my Facebook network. Some of them I actually like, but some of them I don't even remember. Um, I've got my colleagues. So let's say I wanted a recommendation on a paper in data science, okay? So I would say, oh, of my Facebook friends, uh, these are the people whom I trust in data science. And each of them would say, these are the people whom I trust. And how would you propagate? How would I then be able to, to find out whom I should trust and what the outcome should be? Should I believe this paper? Should I not believe this paper? Well, there are an infinite number of ways of propagating. I could just take the majority. That would be pretty stupid because I wouldn't be taking the network structure in, into account. But there are lots of other ways. So what are the recommendation algorithms that I can come up with that have particular properties? And then you go and you test how they actually, um, how they actually behave. So algorithms on networks is a huge area. And finally, network reconstruction algorithms. So here, as I said, there's phylogenetic network reconstruction, also used for language reconstruction, and now for the spread of diseases also, when you try to follow the AIDS virus or something, you're looking at how it's evolving. There's gene regulatory network reconstruction, which we're going we're to spend a lot of time on. There's also reconstruction of learning processes in networks of synapses. So they take these um, 
little round worms where they know the 312 neurons and how they're, con er, little flat worms, um, and how, how they're connected to each other. They put them in different conditions. They shine light on them. They have different kinds of um, food in the medium. And they see how those how those, um, those worms learn, and from that they try to reconstruct what the learning process is on this network. And you know, at a certain point we're going to want to be applying that to human beings and understanding what's going on with us as we get Alzheimer's, you know, where are, are, would there be different parts of the network which we would want to try to, to activate. Okay. So I'm going to now spend the rest of the time talking about a specific class of problems and results. OK, so the standard dogma, and you know, there are all kinds of exceptions to this um, epigenetic things and stuff, but I won't go into any of that. The standard dogma is DNA is transcribed to RNA, is transcribed to proteins. And then the proteins go and they sit on the DNA. And they enhance the transcription of some parts of the DNA, and they inhibit the transcription of other parts of the DNA. So you have a feedback process. You have a network, and you have a feedback process. And so some people call this the protein interactome. And in fact, um, problems with the gene regulatory network are the sources of many human diseases. Now, it's, it's not obvious, though. When, when you look, I mean, I just learned this, this fact recently, and it's stunning to me. In each person in the world, there are on average about 150 deleterious mutations, mutations that actually change an amino acid in a protein, OK? So in the active part. And, and somehow, most of them do, do not cause us problems. But you see somebody who has a certain disease, and so you you look at their genome and you say, oh, I can identify this and this and this and this and this. Well, which are the ones that are responsible for the condition that that person has? It's not at all obvious. Okay, so how do we infer the network structure, which is what we have to infer, from this very partial data? And also, can we identify particular nodes on these networks which are responsible for the dysregulation and then try to have some of those be drug targets, try to modify those particular nodes, and try to control the progression of that disease. OK, so the drug discovery paradigm, there are lots of sources of data. I'm going to be focusing for a kind of cartoon schematic on micro, um, on microarray data, although I'm actually using more than just the microarray data. I put it into a computational model, and I get points of intervention. And you know, all computational biologists do this in different ways. So I'll tell you about the way that, that we've been doing it. What we do is, as I said, I'll just talk about the gene expression data. So microarrays tell us which gene is expressed in the presence of which other gene under a particular set of conditions. So you know, a particular set of conditions for cells in vitro or something happening in, in vivo, and I get a snapshot, a snapshot, a snapshot, OK? Because I'm a physicist, I think of this as like a snapshot of a spin glass, another snapshot of a spin glass, another. So snapshots of the same kind of system, but a little bit different. Each, each one of these snapshots is different, different realizations. And then from the differential expression of a particular gene, so I see this gene happens to be way underexpressed or way overexpressed in this particular set of conditions. I say, wow, that one's like, you know, way overexpressed. It probably has something to do with the pathway that I'm looking at. Okay? So I infer a node weight from that. And then how do I infer edge weights? The way I'm going to infer edge weights is I'm going to say, I look at this species. I look over everything I know about this species. And protein A seems to interact with protein B a lot in this species to, to interact directly. I don't really know because I can't really get into the cell, but it seems to interact directly. Or it doesn't seem to interact directly. And so those would have very different edge weights. OK, so let me now do a simple, um, a simple model. 
It's called the Steiner tree problem. So if you took an algorithms class in grad school, you might know about this, but it's, it's not a difficult model. So what I have is I have a graph. On every edge, I have a weight, which I call Cij. And I also have a set of preferred vertices, preferred nodes, OK? And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to have a tree which connects all of the preferred nodes. I don't care what you do with the other nodes. You can include them or not, such that you minimize the sum of the Cij's along the, the tree, OK? So the solution must, by definition, contain all the preferred nodes. So I have, you know, 20,017 nodes. And of those, I tell you that 387 of them are preferred nodes. So you have to put in those 387. I don't care about the 20,017 minus the 387. You're going to end up having to include some of them to get all the 387 connected to each other. But I want you to do this in such a way that you minimize the sum of the edge weights, the CIJs. And the ones that come in which are not required to be in there are called Steiner nodes. This is an NP-hard problem. It's really hard computationally. And so we found a class of massively parallel algorithms by using some things we knew about phase transitions in physics from the 1980s. Okay, And we are using those algorithms, and they do very well. In a few cases, we can prove those algorithms actually converge. Much more often, we just use them, and they do very well on benchmarks. OK, so now I'm going to make the problem a little more complicated because biological data is actually really dirty. OK, so I'm going to have to make it a little more complicated. So I'm not going to tell you that every node is either a preferred node or not a preferred node. I'm going to tell you that. Even if it's preferred, it might be preferred to a more or less to, to more or less of an extent. So I'm going to give you not only the edge weight CIJ like I did before, but I'm going to tell you that um, of the prizes, some are going to be of, of the preferred nodes, some are going to have big prizes and some are going to have small prizes. And I'm going to give you a positive parameter. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to find a tree which minimizes the cost. So this is the same thing that we had before, this CIJ, the sum of the CIJs. Now, let me just do one thing for you. As lambda goes to infinity, this becomes the same old problem, because anything which has a positive pi i, you need to include, because you want to get that minus infinity there. Okay. I mean, it's e to the, so you don't actually get minus infinities. You get zeros, but it, so it sounds nicer. Um, but the, the point here is that, some proteins are going to be way over or underexpressed, so they're going to have big prizes. Other proteins are just going to be a little under or overexpressed, so they're going to have less prizes. Some are sitting exactly at background value, so they have zero prize. OK, so here's the mapping to the biological data. So I'm trying to minimize this. And now what I do is I say, for the CIJ, so if I'm talking about yeast, I look at all known protein-protein interactions in yeast, and I tell you that if these two proteins seem to interact with each other in a lot of pathways in yeast, then CIJ for those two proteins is going to be very small. If they never seem to interact with each other, CIJ for those, that pair of proteins is going to be very large. Okay. So then, since I'm trying to minimize the sum of the CIJs, I'm going to be trying to use edges in which the proteins are believed to interact with each other a lot. And for the prizes, what I'm going to say is, in this particular experiment, so the prizes are experiment dependent, the edges are, through, are, are for the whole organism, OK, in every experiment for that, um, for that organism. I'm, I'm going to say in this experiment, if I see a lot or a little of this protein relative to its background value, it gets a big prize. If, if I see just the background value, it gets no prize. And you know, middle amount, then it gets some prize. OK, so what are the Steiner nodes? Well, in the standard Steiner tree problem, those are the nodes which are included in that minimizing solution in that tree, but weren't weren't forced to be in there. They just came out to be the solution of the problem, minimize the sum of the CIJs, and connect the, the terminals. In the prize collecting Steiner tree problem, it's not so clear what the Steiner nodes are, but they're the ones that have 
either zero or a low prize, okay, but get included in the solution. So on the left is a network that I start with. On, a right, on the right is a minimizing solution. The CI, so thick means it has a big CIJ, so I don't want to include it. But a big circle means it has a big prize, so I do want to include it. So that circled node is a node which doesn't have a big prize, so I wouldn't want to include it, but it connects things with big prizes to things with big prizes, okay? So I do want to include it because it brings in some juicy nodes for me, okay? In the context of the gene regulatory networks, the Steiner nodes correspond to proteins whose genes are not differentially expressed, but nevertheless seem to participate in the network. So this is like some, some protein sitting there at background value, so nobody would guess it has anything to do with the pathway in question. And yet, the solution to this combinatorial optimization problem is telling you, hey, maybe it does have something to do with that pathway. Maybe just sitting at background value, it's really operating in that pathway. Okay, and so maybe it's a drug target. So we first did this with the yeast pheromone response pathway. The reason we did yeast is because any of you and we, we had no biologist friends at that time. We were just physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists, and so, so the biologists weren't very impressed. But any of you can go and look up all the data on yeast. So we did. And there were like, you know, 15,000 known protein-protein interactions. There were 5,000 known proteins. So this gave us a set of weights. If they were known to interact with each other a lot, then we had a low weight. If they weren't known to interact, we, we had a high weight. And then there were 56, you can find this online, there are probably more now, large-scale gene expression data sets for the yeast pheromone pathway. Each data set gave us a set of prizes. So for each set of prizes, we constructed a tree. So we had 56 trees. And then we superimposed these trees. If you superimpose trees, you don't get a tree. So this is what we got. And then we said, OK, there are going to be two types of proteins along this pathway. There are going to be the proteins that were differentially expressed. We gave them big prizes. So not surprisingly, they showed up in the solution. There are also going to be proteins which were not differentially expressed. We didn't give them big prizes, but they seem to be pretty centrally located and to pull big prizes to, together in one tree, like this COS8, OK? I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Anyway, we went, we found some biologists who were willing to help us to determine whether these proteins were, were important. We had to look far and wide because at that point we were just, you know, physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, data scientists. Um, so they knocked out the gene corresponding to that for us. And then the pheromone response pathway failed. So this was kind of experimental proof, you know, and then we get a PNAS letter, uh, a PNAS paper, and then more biologists are willing to work with us, which is good. So then we went on to doing something we would really like to do which is go from yeast to mammals. I mean, yeast is nice because it's simple, but mammals are what we really care about. So when you go to mammals, you have incomplete interactome data, massively incomplete, 10 times as many transcription factors, huge intergenic regions, so we need fast algorithms. So we looked at glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is what Ted Kennedy died of. Um, an uncle I really love died of this. It is a horrible, horrible cancer. It's brain cancer. Even if you have surgery and chemo and radiation, you die on average within a year. I mean, it's a really awful cancer. And it's four times as common in men as in women. Okay, so can we find glioblastoma pathways using the prize-collecting Steiner tree? Okay, so this is what we got. In this picture, things are a little different than in the last picture I showed you. How red it is represents how big the prize was. So if it's redder, you're not surprised to see it in there. And then we, made, we did the sizes of these things later. So the sizes aren't based on the prizes. The sizes are based on how central something was in the networks. We measured centrality in a particular way, but we tried different ways and they all gave roughly the same thing. So the big circles or the big triangles are very, very central. So the ones that are really, so, okay, 
And then you're working with biologists, so biologists look at this and say, oh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. DNA damage repair, that should be coming up in, in this network, okay? But then there are certain things like, like this one in the middle there that has no prize, doesn't make any sense to people, okay? And yet it's, it's coming up. So five nodes ranked by centrality. The first one is well known. We had given it a relatively large prize. How about the second one? There was no prize, not previously, not previously identified for glioblastoma. So what is it? It's the estrogen receptor. So this is the first pathway link between glioblastoma and gender. You, you remember, it was four times as common in men as in women. There was no pathway link, no explanation, OK? And then we did an experiment. We threw estrogen into a culture, and more cells died. Possible drug therapy. I don't know how to get estrogen into the brain. In, in fact, sometimes when I think about women in science, it would be good to get estrogen into men's brains more. But um, anyway, uh, but it, it, it was a very interesting finding. OK, then we did multiple signaling pathways because you have these parallel pathways. So then we were trying to do Steiner forests instead of Steiner trees. On a cell membrane, lots of different pathways can be starting from that membrane. We came up with a way of doing this. You could say, I want K-trees. You could put in a fugacity for trees, fine. And so this is what we did. We attached everything to an artificial node. It split, and we found parallel working pathways in addition to the hidden Steiner nodes. Did this again on yeast. We got these very interesting pathways. We did it on glioblastoma. The EGFR one is the pathway we had found before, but we found other parallel pathways. OK, the final thing that I want to tell you about is more recent extensions to the reconstruction. I mean, we've all heard about personalized medicine. We also know that with cancer, we really want to personalize it. We give tamoxifen to two women. It works for one woman with breast cancer. It doesn't work for another woman with breast cancer. It's because these breast cancers are different diseases. They're just showing up in the same tissue. OK, so what we did was we took the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a big multi-institutional data set, wonderful, wonderful data set. We looked at this for breast cancer, and we said, we have all these patients. And for each patient, we're going to construct a Steiner forest, OK? And then, so each one of them, we're going to construct a Steiner forest. We're going to find some Steiner nodes. And then we're going to cluster them. And we're going to say, ooh, this, this set of forests looks like each other, that set, that set. OK? So these are maybe different diseases all manifesting themselves in breast tissue. But then we said, wait a second. We know that the Steiner nodes in cluster 1 have something to do with breast cancer. They didn't show up in cluster 2. But why don't we enhance the weights of those nodes in cluster 2 and 3 and 4 and N? OK? Similarly, the Steiner nodes from cluster 2, we enhance in cluster 1, blah, blah, blah. And we do this, and we keep iterating and iterating. So we do machine learning on this. And we come up with highly patient-specific networks, which have input from other clusters. And we found one really interesting thing here. We found one cluster where the Steiner nodes implied that their breast cancer should or could maybe be treatable with known drugs that are treating a certain kind of gastrointestinal tumor, which is really nice because with FDA trials, you would have to, um, you, you don't have to go through the first stage because you, you know it's not toxic. So this kind of personalized thing we're really excited about. We're starting to look for similar things in a big autism data set now. Okay, so the summary. Everywhere we look, we see these networks. We can use all kinds of techniques, always going back to the data to test how, what, what the implications of that are. We get new theories, theorems, experimental predictions, new business models, as you saw on the right-hand side of the, um, of the algorithms page, and possibly even new personalized drug therapies. OK, thanks. <laughs>